Hello everyone, today we talk about Maurice of Nassau and the Dutch army for our Renaissance Warfare series uh, in which we just introduce fundamentally the, the, the essentials of early modern uh, armies, not just in Europe, but as you know. Uh, and this is one of those topics that really makes me reflect on the necessity of going more in depth actually on um, single aspects of this in the future, because presenting a topic like this is, is really, you know, making a synthesis is good by certain standards, but at the same time there are so many, mm, you know, interesting aspects, interpretational problems, matters of method, of sources, etc. that should be more properly uh, addressed, right? And uh, I think you know what I'm talking about. The Dutch army of the Eighty Years' War, uh, and especially after the reforms of Maurice of, of Nassau and his other, and his cousins, um, brought fundamentally um, to some innovations, right, uh, that are credited as fundamentally the first step towards uh, the accomplishment of linear tactics as they would be fundamentally uh, fulfilled by the, the beginning of the 18th century, right? It's normally, it's in fact the Dutch, then eventually the Swedes of uh, Gustavus Adolphus that we haven't made a video on yet, took this path that fundamentally was a bet at the time uh, because military systems are not predictable. Right, and of course, reformers play an important part, but fundamentally, they most of the times just ride the wave of transformations that armies normally undergo by themselves. And this, as you know, <laughs> most you know, European history, it's definitely uh, a moment of uh, intense warfare, of great also, you know, uniformation of the same. That is, European armies at this point are fundamentally very similar in nature, right? So these changes uh, have to be interpreted correctly, also given the context of the same, why these powers that are also remarkably, you know, emerging powers, right? The, the Dutch, uh, after the, uh, the revolt against the Spanish, the Swedes, that up to that point hadn't been a, you know, uh, a major power that would actually, even after the Thirty Years' War, took, took a while, you know, as a middle medium power to eventually reach, you know, the times of Charles the Twelfth later on, as a proper, you know, as a great power, um, that were fundamentally uh, new on the scene. Here we're talking about contendants such as, you know, of the caliber of Spain, right, of France, right, even the Empire, the German model, the tradition, w w was there as a, you know, as an alternative. Um, the same, we, we have made multiple videos on the uh, English army of, of the civil wars mostly uh, and we noticed there uh, an important aspect and historiographically speaking the uh, orange uh, reforms uh, have been you know surrounded by an hour essentially of you know pro idea of um, idea of progress fundamentally an idea of great uh, of revolution as a matter of fact which is probably the worst and most idiotic thing that one could ever say especially talking about early modern warfare that unfortunately now is ingrained into uh, english speaking historiography it's like an autoimmune disease for which you know it doesn't matter where you come from you have to pass through studies that were fundamentally obsessed about themselves i can't find another term fundamentally in early modern warfare there was not even a single military revolution by the any stretch of the imagination possible, right? Uh, these were transformations that took hundreds of years to be brought to an actual, you know, fulfillment. Even if you would, we want to, to look at that like that, right? And it's being recognized even by this historiography by now that, yeah, exactly. I'm referring about Parker, and you know, we all thank him for what. He did. I also seen him recently, actually, um, and uh, and yeah, he also uh, rounded kind of bit the, the the corners of of his theory. But the, the essence of this whole thing is that it doesn't matter at all if a scholar once came up with a mental delusion that since entered the, the vocabulary of historiography, we we should be taken into consideration, right? The, the next step for any intelligent person is to erase completely the word revolution and start studying military history for what it is, 
right, in a diachronic way for the theory of the art and the practice of the art of war for that matter. And stopping to be obsessed with pyrotechnical delusions and special effects for the grossly undereducated masses. This has nothing to do with history, it has nothing to do with strategic studies, it's fundamentally just a narcissistic uh, invention for saying, oh, look, I have my special theory, and Wolfu touches it, right? And I even like these authors, right? I don't, I don't criticize them specifically. I criticize the system as such, right? How is it possible that by the, by the 21st century, like, you know, the academy at, the, at this point is basically doesn't have antibodies to cope with this uh, incredibly incorrect, properly from a conceptual point of view, ideas, Right? There is no need to speak of revolution or other things like the greatest commanders in the modern history, of talking about Maurice and Nassau and the Dutch army. You just have to try to look at what it was right? and keep researching on some basis. It's according to me, are promising. Right? I'm not an expert on these topics, so I will probably also make my share of, of mistakes and inaccuracies. But uh, to me, it gets really down to be concrete about what the essentials of these changes were. Why, like, and questioning, first of all, whether, first of all, we can know the causes. Then we can trace connections properly with the consequences. That is the problem of the historian. Not labeling things uh, with, you know, higher sounding, you know, titles, right? There is no doubt that Maurice of Nassau was one, was a great commander, right? But even, you know, important scholars now have, you know, come to the conclusion that we don't know too much about his actual you know, open field tactical capacities. Why? Because it's normal for the time not knowing that, right? It doesn't matter that he won a striking series of encounters, also two pitch battles. There are, in fact, some, you know, the one, especially Newport, is one of the most important battles in modern history. The question is that if you look at these military systems, you realize, right, and this is valid for any reform. We've seen it for, for Marius, we've seen it even, partly even for Gustavus Adolphus, that there's just a, a tradition that credits them with some change, right? And, and, and we, we, we therefore create the personal link with a guy, and we don't, you know, since it, because you're, we're not documented enough, we don't concretely know what was literally happening on the field. Um, and Wu also brought things into change. And actually, in the case of the Dutch army, um, there is uh, a you know, very interesting background to look at, both from a political, social, organizational, strategical point of view. Even if you look properly at the type of war that we were fighting during the Eight Years' War, and if you compare it, for example, with their uh, mild and fundamentally uninterested involvement in the Thirty Years' War, that, you know, showed something completely different, right? But that's the, the thing one should have to, should start from, like, in a let's say, in a, f for the sake of context, in order to understand why the systems were affected. Because one starts thinking that these were somewhat tactical systems that were created at some point and that would teleologically connect with the, the changes in warfare that would happen, I don't know, 100 years later, finally, to, to get a full completeness. And that, fundamentally, whoever was using something different wasn't properly, you know, gotten there, right, and therefore was backwards, were lagging behind. Um, and that especially doesn't, you know, it focuses chiefly on the tactical aspect without contextualizing it just from a strategical point of view. Uh, the question is, this is not properly a strategic analysis. This is just war gameism by a certain degree, because you're just interested fundamentally on how, you know, also in kind of a positivistic sense of thinking of how, you know, was the fixed model that functioned um, uh, on the field all the time. It's like the uh, tripartite uh, Swiss system of the 15th century. It was adopted in one battle by the Swiss. Uh, that truly had a... I'm talking about formations here, not about the military system that objectively the Swiss created in, in an astonishing way, but properly the, the, the tactical formation that become universal. So the Swiss generally fought like, no, they fought just once like that, right? And, and there is properly no, like, sometimes historical problems are that banal. That is, somebody tells a story like that and then everybody follows. And the question is, what the hell that person said like that? And you understand that that person maybe even, didn't even check well, 
and this true story I, I I find it continuously, especially in my field of you know specialization because when you you are outside of it you say, you tend to say, okay, well, you know we should credit the authority right well, authorities it turns out that make a lot of mistakes, but big ones right not the comma about you know how many men were there in a single company here we're talking about gross mis you know understanding and uh estimations. Uh, on properly a political and strategical scale that is not, um, you know, it's, you know, the, mag the, the magnitude of the mistake is it's something properly that reveals you how the, the person lacks a comparative capacity relatively to, to the rest, you know, of Europe, of the world, right? There are, there are certain things that, you know, uh, were written are ridiculous, like, you know, co comparing uh, apples to oranges, like, you know, with Parker did with Japanese, you know, Back, you know, shock tactics mirroring the, the, the Spanish week in preceding the like gross mistakes that have properly, you know, you you say, but are these even historians? Because that's the the, the real question, and therefore I, every make a, every time I make a video, I always say, you know what, you know, I don't have to say bullshit, right? You know, I have to check my sources, I have to make them correct, but it's obvious that if you're not an expert, you have to rely on texts and studies. Um, you have to essentially, you know, look at them. And realizing that they all say something slightly different, right? Before making this video, I checked some studies and they all stress different aspects. This is interesting. Sometimes literally stating different things. Um, that can, can come to, through also a different degree of, you know, quality of the same studies or maybe because some are synthesis, other are, you know. But the historical problem behind that, right, that, that I lack because the sources I haven't studied. Anyhow, um, Getting to the point, uh, there is also some ideological reason why these accomplishments have been, you know, uh, these tactical reforms have been elevated, right? It was probably started f from the time, right? These were Protestant powers that were rising, uh, acquiring, you know, the, in this case, their freedom, their independence, doing something, you know, that is at that point in the historiographical, you know, vocabulary sense, revolutionary. Uh, because they were creating, for example, a republic. And they would have liked actually to, to call a king at some point, including, you know, the Habsburgic um, Austrians, uh, obviously, you know, no, not the Spanish, but also the English, um, the, 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 the French as well. Um, the, there is, um, here it's part of the context that should be understood, but today we can't talk about the 80 years war and its um, completeness. And then eventually the Swedes came, and we know the, the the feats that they accomplished during the Thirty Years' War, and therefore there's been this idea. Ah, you see, this is the the history of you know the the new world of modern Europe, pioneered by the Protestants, and then Northern Europe, and this you know new you know reality that was modernity, and it was uh, you know wiping out fundamentally the old uh, Catholic obscurantism and the Middle Ages and all this stuff. Th this is a true, like as as you see, I actually have a positive idea of the Dutch military reforms. I don't believe that they were, uh, they, I think they were a success, right? I think they they were, especially when contextualizing their specific political and strategical goal, why these armies were created, and they had these features, right? And it, they were properly an, an advanced army for the time, right? But it was a product of that reality, right? Um, as others were product of others. You see, uh, during the same time, I don't know, the Germans, the the Spanish, uh, this is even during the Thirty Years' War that proved on a large scale, kept, for example, using the older formations. The question is why, right? That because they were stupid? No. Uh, it's because, evidently, um, just banally, you could say that the Netherlands are not Germany as battlefields in the first place. Also, uh, the size of these armies are different. The powers properly they are using are different. So, um, there is not like a proof that, for example, the Dutch reform was somewhat, you know, successful in any case. For example, the victories that were accomplished um, on the field were often, you know, be, you know, aside. Uh, and this is not a disadvantage. It's actually an intelligent thing to do for, from Maurice that won an astonishing uh, amount of, of victories was basically undefeated. Um, um, Lots of other battles that, um, for example, the Spanish generals such as uh, Farnese, the, the, Parma, the Duke of Parma, and um, Spinola wanted to give, you know, battle properly in the open field, and that 
Maurice of Nassau refused because he recognized his tactical inferiority at that point. That naturally does, that it's not connected to uh, you know the uh, you know the tactical formula because as we will see, things were similar. So we are at the beginning of these toying with the ratio of pikes, muskets thinning the line because at the end of the day, uh, the 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 bet as we were saying was that. Fundamentally, uh, the missile, of, you know, firepower would be mm, more effective uh, than uh, the stopping power, right? Or you know, the the assaulting capacity of, of the pike in hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? Nobody up to that time had objectively had the possibility of testing that. The Dutch did. The question is what they did, why they did it, is that they were in a specific situation, because nobody liked to rise armies at the time. They cost it a hell of money. Uh, the Dutch had, and, and that's also why they began to, um, to, to accomplish proper certain organizational uh, feats, such as the fact that we're talking properly of a professional, a full round professional army, and that was maintained all the year round, right? This is really new. Basically, it had very few of Dutch either, because they were based al almost all foreign mercenaries from other countries, mostly England, um, uh, France, Germany, uh, other Protestant powers, uh, etc. There were some Dutch units too, uh, and they were talking about the army. Then, of course, there were the militias that also played an important role, uh, especially in the early phase of the Eighty Years' War. And there are also some, you know, famous episodes, but, you know, there's still their militias, there's something else. Um, and uh, there is, yeah, there's definitely an improvement in that pattern. And the tactical reform fundamentally consisted, as we will see, in this uh, uh, resizing of the, properly of the blocks of pikemen and um, and shots, let's call them pikes and shots more, more quickly, um, and fundamentally thinning their lines and therefore uh, lengthening their their front and deploying in a uh, so the smaller units were easier to control in the field. We deployed on multiple lines in a kind of checkerboard formation, and that were aimed at that point, as we'll see also not always but prevalently in a defensive sense to properly wear out the enemy. Um, in a you know relying more on firepower than had been the case um, in the past. Uh, this was achieved uh, apparently not much through, especially under Maurice of Nassau, an actual inc uh, increase uh, in the ratio of shots. Because as we will see, the thinning of the line exposed the formation properly to, to cavalry charge. And we will see how also the Dutch army had a hell of, of cavalry at this point, that some, at some point even won victories on, on its own, right, without infantry. Never underestimate cavalry. People normally think that, you know, Renaissance warriors had come to, to like, kind of a sand, you know, a dramatic reduction. It's not entirely true. Um, every kind of cavalry could charge and did charge when needed. And that, for the foot shots specifically, uh, relied mostly on this standardized drill that told troops fundamentally how to uh, fire volleys orderly when possible, meaning that the Dutch began to do it on a regular base uh, at this point, exactly for this higher level professionalism and continued trained, they, they made mock battles, they were properly always trained to do that. So they became mechanic, a mechanic reflex under fire, under stress, to be able to replicate that mechanically and therefore maintaining the rate of fire constant also in European warfare this was mostly the deal right you know having a constant fire so much the Dutch as we will see pioneered a sort of what would become platoon fire tact so that they they shot specifically on you know actually not a you know a guy at a time in the line but uh, um, platoons uh, one after the other in the line right to maintain that but we will see it later um, and therefore you know, scoring also important successes, as we've seen. Newport being the most important ones, where, you know, firepower was definitely mm, very, very important, um, and to defeat the Royalist army. And uh, the context, as we were saying, is fundamental, right? The Dutch army was born with a nation probe. 
right? Uh, you know what's the story, all the Habsburg, uh, Burgundian legacy, um, important area, areas of Europe that had begun, you know, to, to, to develop now, especially, you know, in intercontinental trade. Uh, the north of the, the Netherlands was becoming now, but was rising more than what had been traditionally the, essentially the Flemish um south um and the um, and and the the revolt broke out uh you know it's formally on history books is fifteen sixty eight right with the first dutch uh victory um but uh, you know the, there are, there is a very you know complex and also complicated background that today we can't give uh, they that this is the date however in which the Netherlands started their long war of independence against Spain, uh, causing, by the way, some of the biggest international changes at the time, because literally uh, Spain, you know, uh, bled itself white, or, you know, this is also a bit of a, uh, not a, not of a myth, but still th th there are certain aspects of Spanish economy that, that should be taken into consideration. It wasn't just because of the Netherlands, as properly uh, there was nothing properly deterministic about the fact that the 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 you know the Dutch revolt would have eventually succeeded, or that it would have eventually ha you know it would have previously happened in the first place, right? So, and in uh, relative to the first aspect, Maurice of Nassau definitely you know scored those victories that were able to secure, especially in the north. Uh, in fact, is what we you know the Netherlands today, um, the, the seven United Provinces. Uh, uh, you know, important strategic consolidation and, you know, bringing also the participation of the communities, creating this permanent army was a big deal for the time, as we've seen. Um, so war would be continued from 1568 to the 12 years truce of uh, 1609. Um, so this tells you already what the deal was. The, the, if you look at the map of the Netherlands, with do, you know dotted with all the battlefields, were just fought in these years, and you know that the area would be you know so the theater, especially well, be mostly with Belgium, but still uh, 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 the battleground of Europe. Right, and many times eventually the the French will invade uh, the Netherlands in the, in the second half of the 17th century. Would go on like there would be so many different. Uh, you know, uh, wars fought on the same soil, so you kind of learned by heart also the geography of the country because of that, because if you study these battles. Um, and think in this sense how the local communities properly reacted to, to this, right? They were, they were essentially a bunch of rebels fighting the greatest power of the time. So it, it's some, it was something clamorous in the first place, Right, the thing was not, um, you know, it's not a pleasant history uh, story to, to to read proper, also because of the sheer amount of violence uh, that you know and all the the, the problems properly that war presented at that level. Not just uh, this is very interesting to study naturally also from the Spanish perspective, uh, the route of Flanders, all the, especially the logistical problems. And so, but also, in that sense, state building for, for the sake of maintaining armies, which is basically the light motive of, of the whole early modern, of early modern warfare. Um, and uh, as we were saying before, war would be uh, once renewed during the Thirty Years' War period, where, you know, uh, for the mention of Maurice, the, 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 army didn't, the Dutch army didn't change particularly, but mostly consolidated its uniformity, its modernity in that regard. I mean, as a formula, tactically, also things remain relatively unvaried. Um, and the United Provinces, in this sense, had to properly cope with, as we've seen, Europe's greatest military power uh, that was also made of veteran troops, right? So uh, it was obvious that at this point the, 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 the Dutch were helped also by other powers that received money, uh, proper men, as we've seen, basically the Dutch army was made up of foreigners, but those would have come anyway. The problem is it was finding the money, and to receive this assistance. It was possible, um, in this regard, to um, you know, to see how tactical developments definitely parallel this Dutch success and effort in the first place to achieve it um, in this context. Um, an important thing to stress is also that the Dutch army was overall relatively small. Mm -hmm. uh, this is um, 
you know, the Dutch had histor a very uh, in interesting military history during, especially this, um, you know, the 17th century. You know that fundamentally here it's one century later, but the Dutch army uh, between the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century is probably the, the strongest army in terms of economic cost-benefit ratio, right? Which is a clamor of success from a political point of view. I mean, if you wonder why, you know, the Dutch are still so rich. Well, they, it's because they consolidated properly that power at the time. Something that other countries didn't. Like, if you pick, I don't know, Germany, is is it's not really a rich country. Like, the, the Netherlands, the UK, etc., historically, uh, managed to sediment this enormous amount of capitals, uh, thanks to the, uh, uh, an incredibly, you know, clear, especially with for the Dutch, that had limited interests, also they were a bit more, um, uh, they had their, you know, uh, empire, let's say, but they, they were more commercially minded at the end of the day. They were great treasurers, right? Um, the pro well, this stemmed from a vision, right, that they started building at this time, right? And that made them properly, the, uh, still to today, among the, properly the richest peoples in the world. It's a dire consequence of this. Um, so, one reason why their army was, so, you understand it a small army against a big power, as we've seen here, has to be qualitative, right? And it's a bit, the, in a nutshell, the history of the Dutch. Even this will be uh, true for, you know, the next big power in, in the late century, that is France. It's a bit the same thing. Hence that entrepreneurial also model that uh, served already at this point to properly um, uh, serve the army. The pay of the Dutch companies was subcontracted right uh by to, to these merchants that provided essentially the the um, that anticipated the, the pay right the for for the troops right in event in exchange for a monthly you know rate um uh, you know of compensation um so this was one of the reasons because of these capitals that could provide immediately this pay and that for this reason you know, it was also kind of a privilege to be in Dutch service because there were certain agevolations, um, kind of um, you know, extras for, for the for the troops that, for you know, for European standards of the time were unknown, right? So it was important, and this is crucial to understand that you know, to to maintain these armies at a decent strength, right? Because most troops, you know, armies at this point simply melted away, right? The uh, the French, uh, the Spanish had a ridiculous rate properly of, you know, of desertion at this time. Here, the Dutch army was small, but it was kept, uh, you know, mostly desertion was, was limited to at one fourth, right? Um, it, ideally, right, even in here, but still with some standards were controlled by, by the states. Um, and consider also, uh, uh, the Netherlands didn't have a large population. Right, uh, their force also were directed more to the sea than the land. Uh, they were mostly, as we've seen, mm, uh, commercially minded, right? And normally, as we've seen also now, rather think about Venice, etc. You know, the, the idea of maintaining a standing army was normally, and also for land uh, enterprises, was considered more more a burden than, than else. In this case, a literally a necessity from a threat from from annihilation, um, but still. Uh, it was something the, the citizens w wanted to pay for someone else to serve. It's just also, you know, there is really nothing bad uh, about. As we've seen, there were always several native Dutch units at the same time. Also, the vital role of city defense uh, was, you know, especially in the first time, was due to the, um, to the bravery of the local burger militia. Uh, there are interesting episodes. I don't know if you ever uh, heard about the widow of Kenau Asenle, uh, that um, was basically uh, helped to de defend Harlem in 1572 um, at the head of a ferocious corps of women armed with swords, dagger, and firearms. Right, you know, decapitating, uh, the, you know, the Spanish head, the the, the, the royalists, and. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's how crude as you can get. But as I was saying, those were malicious. Uh, a modern army cannot rely on malicious, right? It has to have a, a permanent professional body of troops. At this time, professional, right? Because already permanent was was here just happening for the first time w with the Dutch. And actually, there is a pre-Maurice of Nassau army 
that must be taken into consideration that normally at the time uh, was influenced by Spanish uh, military culture Saint Dutch I mean they were basically within the the Habsburgs entourage uh, politically historically but as these uh, inheritance lands uh, were historically here Charles V had died from you know not even 20 years right and he loved the the Netherlands as hell right he, he uh, that's what part of the reason why he was he, he was so proud of them he wanted to attach to the most important kingdom of Spain for his um, first son and uh, Philip II that fought uh, the war uh, eventually and um, so that's also an interesting story that when you you read you, you understand how things might have literally gone in, in very different ways right even for, for certain political choices for certain necessities certain figures sometimes but it's not for us today to speak and as we were saying before these professional foreign troops were paid by the Dutch states um, there were properly entire um, mercenary units right um, sent as official aid for for example from England uh, and or also other so-called gentlemen of the religion that is Protestants from all over Europe that were wanted to, to join the fight against Spain um, and for for cash naturally um, and um, so the the Netherlands at this point were considered as you know the best European employers because not only they were fairly generous with the pay but they offered that regular year-round employment for example Poland also was uh, you know popular in that sense it paid very well actually but only for the campaigning season right because the Schlags said you know at the end of the campaign okay we do it but then stop there shouldn't be any permanent power because we don't want to give to central uh, authority too much too much uh, weight um, and yeah, speaking of future of, of nations and look what happened to Poland, look what happened to the Netherlands eventually. And that, that tells you just even in a Western perspective how important the military is and how important war is and how literally civilization passes through creating armies and knowing how to make them work, right? Because they have a specific function that is in the first place to protect a nation. Uh, that is a very political and civic thing and moral thing. Um, to, to do in the first place um, there were even in the Dutch army some pension arrangements for the disabled that in the modern age started to become a problem we made um, a video about the French army in that sense for all these veterans that were fundamentally outcasts at the end of it because they, they were left on, on their own and they caused severe problems and you know that's where European society started to be prudent about these things um, and to literally isolate and internate uh, beggars, uh, you know, etc. Um, the um, the main aspect, I would say, that the most important factor that contributed to Maurice of Nassau's uh, reform, in my opinion, is properly the fact that he was operating with an orderly uh, professional force. Right, it was a disciplined mercenary force um, and th the question is always the same right if you don't have profession professional armies you can't fundamentally even hope for higher standards this is history of, of of warfare in a nutshell right why were you know the great armies in history superior to others because they were produced by civilizations that provided with intelligence that is moral and consequently also understanding material resources the level of collective training that only a professional army body of troops can have in the first place right that's why other civilizations are properly inferior because they haven't reached that level of development and we have to be extremely clear about this because the cultures are not debated there is not such things like a superior and inferior culture but when you look at state building and making a, a you know an, a professional army yes those peoples that make that are superior civilizations to those who don't right and this is reflected morally 
at levels of, you know, here the Netherlands were rising to also certain cultural standards that would be, uh, you know, were extremely important in Europe. But it went in parallel properly to the widening of new horizons from a mental point of view, from a cultural point of view. And these things must be accepted and understood because uh, if one doesn't, basically doesn't have a, a true moral orientation in the world, in history, right? Um, as controversial as it sounds, because of course these eventually went around, you know, the Dutch were some of the most ferocious colonialists historically, like basically any colonial, but you know, still, you know, uh, they contributed to what we know in the path of, uh, you know, together with our human rights, of, you know, that co contributing to modernity as we know it and as we enjoy it and uh, how, how we understood that also certain things couldn't last and because they were doomed and that's also another you know feat of accomplishment of civilization as well so but it's never linear in the history of mankind of fortune um, so it's important also to stress in this regard that Maurice of Nassau's reforms were specifically for the benefit of the mercenaries right uh, the main problem was keeping this army fit standing as you've seen to make the troops remaining they're not deserting right and maurice improved consistently in fact the soldiers career prospects for this reason um, uh, for example he insisted that foreign units should have properly officers of their own nationality we have seen this when looking at the swedish uh, color regiments for example where also they had this prominent uh, feature of you know uh, foreign elements there so this was a shared model this is a bit typical of, of modern warfare altogether also future you know armies would often have properly national armies would have a, the, the records were, were coming from many other countries were coming from criminals from you know uh, exiles all these things um, and the important was joining having a pay which is just what makes troops fight well Right, and also let's erase any stereotype towards mercenaries. Right, the problem is not, you know, about you know uh, doing things for money because at the end of the day, also national armies do the same. Um, and actually, those who are forced to fight often at this point are they actually didn't give a shit about their navy; they just wanted to 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 live a normal life. Um, and it's just about the political control that you can reach on it. And uh, this is also another aspect that to, today we can't discuss because we could talk about just the military one but it's all behind the uh, Dutch War of Independence uh, Maurice founded a military college at Breda that was open both to uh, uh, foreign born and Dutch officers so much evidently the foreign element was important in the army that you know it was paid for for providing the right education to every officer independently from his own uh, nationality. Uh, in 1600, the Dutch army comprised 43 English companies uh, in three regiments. Interestingly enough, the first English unit in Dutch service in 1572 was eventually to become the Buffs, one of those famous British regiments. Uh, 32 French companies uh, in two regiments, 20 companies of Scots, 11 of Walloons, 9 of Germans, and only 17 of Dutch. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the the proportion from the men. So there were more Scottish people than Dutch in the, uh, in the Dutch arm. Um, and uh, in the early stages of the war with Spain, the uh, Dutch forces, though managing to keep the war going on, uh, had an almost unbroken run of disasters, right? Um, the, at least in the open field, where the Spanish were definitely um, a power to, to, to be reckoned with. Um, and, in fact, to, there is just a single success that, as we have seen, is uh, normally credited as probably the beginning of the war, that is uh, Heiliger Lee um, in 1568. Now, William the Silent was a uh, more persistent than lucky leader, right? By 1520, the Netherlands total forces had built up to 3,000 cavalry and uh, some 28,000 infantry. This um, counts uh, garrisons, right, as well. So there were even less. 
as you understand there was an important cavalry uh, ratio as we will see uh, we were hinting at before produced important victories right sometimes also on their own with the sole mounted arm uh, so what were the uh, Dutch infantry companies about well there were something at, at this point we're talking about pre Maurice of Nassau right so there were uh, something around 150 200 men strong right and the uh, ratio of shots and pikes was something like uh, two uh, to one right and uh, the regiments uh, were ad only administered of units that is on the field the companies were still as we'll see distributed in different ways right they could vary from 3 to 15 uh, companies per regiment namely it seems that 10 or 11 were the, the typical thing uh, and on the field they would form mostly in the Spanish manner right uh, it was dominating in two uh, uh, one two three uh, la very large so-called battalions that in Dutch are called open um, and um, being made most of this bulk of pikemen, uh, as you know, uh, deeper than uh, than than was wide. Right at this point, the depth of pikemen was something like thirty ranks. Right, with some uh, wings, let's say, uh, of shots that flanked properly the the pikemen block, and also a thin screen of forlorn hope uh, shooters in the front to fundamentally skirmish a little bit and also in theory you see that here at this point uh, arquebusiers, musketeers were mostly directing their own fire not against their counterparts but against the pikemen right and especially in defense which at this point for the Dutch was mostly the case by strategical and often also tactical uh, necessity um, naturally uh, was essentially a aiming at uh, killing as many pikemen as possible during the advance against the, their own lives, right? And uh, this is fundamentally the, the history of pike and shot, right? You know, the pike disappears at the point at which the shot became capable of uh, annihilating the uh, the offensive potential of the same pike, right? This went in parallel with properly different changes, and the Dutch began to do this. It's very important to stress the, this thing of defensive terrain, whatever, because um, the, uh, as you know, like these campaigns uh, couldn't be possible in the Netherlands without crossing several rivers each time because of how just the nature of, of, of the land with uh, channels, um, uh, rivers, marshes, right? So uh, in, a, in a strategical situation like this, it's obvious that the Dutch may have uh, developed also their tactical system in function of a bit more of a defensivistic attitude, especially in infantry. As we'll see, instead their cavalry was was quite aggressive. But this explains also certain aspects of you know uh, I, I wouldn't say they were camping right, but the increase in importance in in shot and this kind of greater flexibility or possibility also to to have thinner lines, maybe if they were protected by a ditch or whatever, uh, might have played. A role, a factor, in a in in in, in the in the world picture, right? Um, speaking of cavalry, pre uh, Maurice of Nassau's times, well, um, in, in total, um, we can count at twenty-two percent of lancers that still existed at this time. As we'll see Maurice will fundamentally get rid of them. Um, they carried pistols, uh, at least one pistol each, by the fifteen nineties on average. While 70% of cavalry was made up of armored pistoliers, right? The rest, the 8%, was mounted or kibbuziers. Cavalry um, um, was essentially um, uh, grouped in uh, in ensigns, vanen. So this would be fundamentally the squadrons from 50 to 150 strong, and the arquebusiers usually being in the smaller units while the pistoliers in the larger ones and regiments similarly for infantry being set up only provisionally um, for for 
battle for tactical contingency so these ensigns could be you know grouped uh, in different ways now um, in 1590 Prince Maurice of Nassau that had already been a soldier he had acquired uh, an important uh, military experience through artillery as we will see and at this time he was a uh, Stadtholder of the province of Holland where also the struggle was mostly direct, being directed from against the, the Spanish, that had the, the Spanish had conquered basically almost all the Netherlands at, the, at that point, and there is this coming back right of the Dutch to manage to secure this line, especially from from the north, in fact, of Holland. Um, at this time, Maurice was only twenty three years old, right, and become commander in chief of the Dutch armies altogether. So, in the following twenty years. He fought, as we've seen, Spain's finest generals, such as Spinola, Farnese, uh, and their veteran Tertius, to a standstill. Right? He commanded in, uh, uh, 29 sieges and two full-scale battles, all which he won. Right? And this success secured effectively the independence of his country. Um, so he started these, what, what appear as drastic reforms of the Dutch army altogether, right? The most successful reforms are the ones that take place in a broader, omnicomprehensive uh, fashion driven by a specific vision and understanding and as we've seen had this important background. So essentially 20 years of, of warfare that change an army and that make it properly work on the field already independently from the reformers something different than before a professional one that therefore already knows its ideal and organizes itself as such, the various officers, the commissions, etc., and has to properly cope with the concrete problems of war, right? Uh, you know, supplies, armament, the, the, this all needed a background as well. Uh, and in combat, this system had already had been tested properly. So, um, the success of the Dutch reforms has been historically, you know, uh, attributed also by this, uh, to, to the scale of uh, imitation from other armies, uh, chiefly the Protestant powers, right? As we've seen, this mm, was not universally met, right? Uh, in the 17th century, definitely there was this idea that that uh, Maurice of Nassau had started the thing, and then eventually the Swedes would copy, for example, the Dutch brigades at some point, you know, fundamentally developing uh, something on, on, on their own. Um, and uh, in, in this, uh, Maurice was associated uh, with uh, his cousin William Louis, that uh, also, you know, th th there was a theoretical and practical thing altogether. They, they first studied this thing at table, even li literally with l little uh, lad soldiers, a bit like war gamers, and then they, they would eventually test these things in battle. And we're, we're in in possession of interesting data, letters, uh, you know, notes uh, uh, from William Louis, also uh, to to properly to Maurice and other um, documents, etc. That reveal properly certain uh, mechanisms of of the Dutch army on the field that we can't quite you know directly transpose as if you know that was the actual reality, right? Uh, consider also this aspect that many, uh, like many m military thinkers of the Renaissance, from Machiavelli onwards, for example, Maurice of Nassau was inspired by classical works, such as the ones of Vegetius and, and Leo. Now, this aspect, like, you know, uh, th this had already, which also the French had been fascinated with that, think about the Roman legions of Francis I, you know, these attempts that reveal, naturally, at certain levels, a degree of naivety that you don't understand whether it was just, you know, for having fun or testing stuff. But, you know, Maurice at some point, you know, extended, uh, you know, to, to, mm, to ordering his officers to learn Latin, right? And kitting out an experimental company, uh, Roman fashion with sword, shield, and spear. Right, these are kind of the this mod. They have nothing to do with properly Renaissance uh, warfare in itself. Uh, then, of course, uh, this um, 
you know, that, so, but it's important because there are people who believe fundamentally that this kind of classical influence was, you know, the sap, right? You know, we have the idea of, you know, the terrible Middle Ages and then the Renaissance happened because they started, they, they got intelligent back again, you know, they started imitating the Romans, the, the Greek, whatever. Um, Western civilization had gone past, beyond uh, classical one already during the fundamentally the late Middle Ages. And uh, this was nonsense, right? And but so much was properly the hour still existing around classical, uh, the classical world that these great leaders wanted to imitate uh, the Macedonians, the Romans, and all this stuff. Now, um, in parallel to this, naturally there is much more concrete change that goes all around. Like we we could have to. Um, uh, the list all the modifications like in every field of the army that happened more or less around this time we would never end right everything was functionalized right everything was properly improved uh, in a way that to me reflects banally what a professional army would do in, in 20 years of consecutive war right and not much uh, and more actually um, and not needing to think that there had been the genius who came up that to, to do that in the first place. These guys had the money, they had the professionals, they had military experience, they started making things work. And this is why the Dutch reforms happen in the first place. And in this regard, I would like to put it in perspective to see that, you know, that's essentially also what, in the moment of, of modernization of other countries and development of a state, you know, uh, pattern, but things would properly happen by themselves like that. When you find properly the, the a stable state that can you know properly collect enough money to destine to to the military and you know increasing you know its supplying uh, capacity uh, its uh, armament uniformity it's you know properly also the size of the you have military improvements and this is fundamentally the history yeah of the Dutch under Maurice de Nassau of Nassau. Um, uh, the Swedes of Gustavus Adolphus, the French of Louis XIV, etc., etc., right? And the art of war changed in, in, in the meanwhile. But it changed also because of practice. And about this practice, we, we are not in, entirely sure of the mechanisms, at least that, that laid under such changes, meaning that we can understand them, ideally, but also we're not directly documented all the time. You just see these leaders thinking and toying with, with new ideas and trying to put some of them in practice, some succeeding, some failing, picking the best of the results and, you know, stand, you know, uniforming that. But still, at the end of the day, what makes war, as Montecuccoli would say in a, in, a few, in a few generations, is money, money, and money, right? And, yeah, that was exactly uh, the point also having been captured by the Swedes <laughs> during the Thirty Years' War, understanding what, 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 what that modernity, what modernity was passing through. Uh, something still taken from classical uh, manuals that was of, 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 of consistent uh, use was, for example, the standardized layout of the camps in which the Dutch army spent the summer with neat company streets with officer stands at the end uh, surrounding the train and the tall tent of the, the, the commander. More important, and, and that's something also I, I would insist much on, is was the uh, regular standardized drill and training, including mock battles, but uh, much else, such as, for example, the fact that officers had to undergo uh, an examination uh, that included some, you know, properly tests, uh, including capacity, also from, from a management point of view, like, you know, given this number of uh, uh, cavalrymen or infantrymen, uh, how much is the total of, of their monthly pay, right, um, that they had to provide for but through the subcontracts. Uh, also, the troops were required certain standards of efficiency, uh, with with punishments in case of failure. For example, they had to shoot at certain targets and hit. Uh, they, they they couldn't go around uh, pointing the their guns, you know, uh, straight ahead. You know, they had always to po point for safety reasons uh, towards uh, the sky. Um, and uh, 
in the sense also of enforcing a greater discipline and resources. Like if you have to make mock battles, you have properly have to spend more resources. All these things cost, cost calories, cost food, cost water. You have to bring that stuff on the field. You have to uh, to, to 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 support these men. Uh, you have to. To, to make them march, you have to feed the horses, you have to make them shoot, as we've seen, you have to, to repeat these movements over and over again. A standardized drill, as we were saying before, would be particularly important, especially for the shots, that would, in in ba an actual battle, Newport, for example, is a, is a good example, even under great st severe stress, manage to maintain the volley rhythm. Right, and also on this, um, that as you know is more important than actually, you know, the same amount of shots, but uh, shot in um, randomly. Right, the concept of the volley is that um, if, even if the same amount of of, of, of bullets shot, you uh, the, the fact that you shoot them all at once, orderly against the enemy lines, is that you cause a greater overall damage in interest of time to that formation. That for them has a greater psychological. Uh, effect then you know the same amount of shots maybe in killing the same amount of people but still diluted over the same amount of time um, between uh, two volleys right this is crucial also because it's how shock tactics properly work and as we've seen also how closely infantry work with with cavalry in the Dutch army to exploit this you know uh, wavering of, of the enemy lines that could, the cavalry could could launch themselves charge into um, and um, and there is also debate about how um, properly this volley system function. Um, some people say that Maurice introduced the counter march. There is, as far as I understand, some documents that properly show this. That for which the uh, you know that the uh, the shot the the shots were normally dis uh, distanced, right? The various soldiers had normally already some uh, fit distance because. Uh, at this time, uh, bandoliers could easily take fire altogether. So, in order to uh, avoid domino effects with um, soldiers exploding breaking in a row next to each other, they had to be distanced. But while well, Maurice is credited, as far as I understand it, to have widened further uh, the uh, the order, which naturally occupied more space, right, more more surface, and in order to make uh, you know the, the first um, the first rank shoot. Uh, and then for the individual soldiers to run back their uh, right, presumably in the corridors between the troops, and then therefore the other rank advancing and shooting again. Well, the system revealed it probably too complicated. They they would carry out something else. There was a uh, convergence. It was another thing that is you know, the line shot. Um, that the first rank shot, and then you know the guys would essentially defile. Um, Half and half on, on the on the sides, right? Or maybe I don't know, all on one side of the formation coming and uh, lining up back again, rather than the other system. The problem is that these, uh, wh whichever this worked like, th the problem was not the idea of conceiving the volley. You see, also to make you understand properly what's the improvement of these reforms concretely. Like it, everybody knew since you know ever. Like also you know arrows were normally launched in, in volleys historically, like in, in warfare. Why? Because of the same effect. So the problem was not conceiving the volley, or you know coming up with the genial idea of of conceiving volleys of guys that march defile in the, in the corridors. Oh my God! What what what? A, what the genius came up with? Everybody had always known that in all history of mankind. The the, the main problem was to keep this thing orderly, right? And if you don't have training, if you don't have people that, you know, this mess with with guts spilled around, you know, cannons making, you know, people explode, like, you know, throwing limbs everywhere, uh, the smoke, the chaos, the disorder, you, you couldn't see anything, you freaked out all the time. To maintain a freaking order, that is to say, maintain guys in line, not making them... Be behaving in a herd group, but fundamentally never losing uh, their plot and remaining orderly into a formation that changes, um, you know, rhythmically, always in the same way. That is the deal. And this had not happened in a standardized fashion on a regular base, because we we presume, well, actually also the Spanish was, contrary to what is, we're, we're making the same experiments, even if they were less, you know, you know eventually uh, applied, but, you know, Everybody was thinking about the stuff uh, 
around Europe. Like it was nothing strange. Um, but probably if you don't, until you don't have the professionals, until you don't have somebody that is trained, that that that, that is is paid for training or all that amount of time before battle, you can have this. And the question is, well, but but also I don't know. Also, the Spanish has had veterans. The word of the uh, up to that time they had you know, maintain a degree of professionalism. Yes, but you also have to consider the concept of good enough in warfare. That is to say, until you're not pressured, you don't have any particular, you know, uh, anxiety to succeed in certain situations, which in war naturally is always present. But as we've seen, this is something that, that precedes warfare, war properly. This has to do with the training of the troops. And for somebody who had put them under drill and paid for them for that specific reason, well, um, you don't even care that much like you want to economize right as we have seen uh there was all uh uh we have seen that video on the spanish rope like there was all a kind of speculation behind sub subcontracts and, and all this thing so that w w that's why it's so important to stress the control on the troops right properly from the state in a direct fashion in a uniform way for having a specific strategical goal and certain specific tactical standards. Other armies in Europe had not had the situation the Dutch were fi finding themselves in. The same resources, the same concerns, same goals. These guys started to do it and enforced it, right? So that the, these guys' brains would function uh, mechanically, even in stress conditions, to work orderly like that, to deliver volleys rhythmically, orderly, and for the best effort. Right, this is particularly important, um, and uh, lots of other things. For example, there was a permanent um, officer cadre, right, and uh, with properly a, uh, also professional background there. That is fundamental. These guys have to be led by competent people, right? So we could list lots of things in this regard. There were lots of engineers, uh, pioneers. But this was most. These wars were mostly about siege, right, and we've seen it also with Maurice of Nassau that was an uh, expert in artillery, brought there lots of new competences, um, uh, property of new minds, right? Also, nothing was really standardized at the time. Like all the various military engineers uh, before a siege were asked how what would have been the, the best fortification solution. They, they all came up with a different idea. So um, it was a matter of being exposed for the first time in a concentrated fashion to these problems and to f f sort out the means to find the best solution. Right, and this goes like in the history of mankind, in the history of science, of technology, uh, uh, by attempts, right, also failing badly, uh, risking all the time, but still managing to get that experience. And until you don't go on the field, you can't properly have. That's why I say don't underestimate the fact that these guys were already professionals on their own, right, uh, because uh, they already knew what the craft of war was about. Right, and maybe the same um, army organized in the same way, but with with fresh uh, recruits from you know like levies and, and draftees and so on, would have not had maybe the same success so much. For example, I don't know, the Danish copied the Dutch drill and they failed. Why? Because Denmark was a different country from the Netherlands, and they didn't have the same. Uh, some political, strategical situation. They didn't have the same, uh, you know, ba internal balance of resources, whatever. So, once again, it's never about the uh, more intelligent or more stupid guy that comes up with the genial idea. It's about the context and how this is, you know, this allows the change in the first place, right? It can also fail. Like, as far as we know, if you study military history in this regard, like, the Dutch could be defeated in the, still by the Spanish. It, it might have happened concretely. Right, because war is always about that. It's never fighting because you know you have you're sure that therefore you will win. Right, you have to fight if you want to have a hope in the first place for winning. But you can't have a certainty ever. Right, and it's full of interesting um, military situations where you had actually more advanced military systems that are defeated by you know more primitive ones because simply even in there the context brings it to, to that to that end. Um, now, in terms of organics, th this is important. Um, uh, really, um, Maurice made one of the single most relevant changes, right, in in, uh, in the Dutch army. Uh, it was the creation of the new 
Uh, some say division, some say battalion. Uh, I've seen that basically this is could be equated to regiment at, at, at some point, right? It depends also on the terminology, right? For example, ensigns you can find in, uh, for cavalry, you can find in some texts that are called squadrons in a more modernizing terminology. So here it's mostly important to, to understand what, what we're talking about. Um, the the new but uh, let's call it division here um, became fundamentally the uh, basic infantry battlefield unit, right? It was reduced from of tens of companies to the thousands of men, of, uh, of officially five hundred and fifty men, right? This ter this number is actually coming from the Roman cohort. Right, that Maurice wanted to copy in this regard, but there were concrete advantages properly from from this number that actually varied. It was often uh, larger, right? So, um, in practice, um, so these tens of, of companies of, that would be, as we will see, also smaller in size for this reason, formed um, two or more of these divisions on the field, uh, each with pikes. In the center, musketeers on each side of them, the arquebusiers on the extreme flank, right, and the depth, right, of this formation. That, as you understand, is uh, fundamentally similar, uh, if not the same, to the to previous Dutch, read also Spanish model. Uh, not thirty, but ten ranks deep. Some also say a from eight to twelve. It depends because, as we will see, these divisions were not fully standardized, they, they vary number, they, they varied also a little bit. The important thing though is basically you have on average the reduction in depth of uh, 66%. You have one third of the original. This changed a big deal. This is the real bet and probably the most interesting thing about the Dutch reforms. I mean, the idea that uh, these divisions, as we will see, uh, would form uh, old, Mm, two or more divisions would form fundamentally a line, right? It would put one next to the other in the field. They would form a brigade, right? And they would form uh, three brigades, but in depth, so would form three lines, disposed in depth, would form properly the army. Uh, these three brigades would be uh, in, in interest of depth first the, the vanguard, then the battle, and the rear guard. So forming this, and, and the divisions internally would dis dispose in a checkerboard formation. Even here, we don't know whether you know uh, imitating the the, man, the manipular legion. Uh, um, this is not perhaps even so important. The important is is the concept of of this. And as we've seen, it mostly also in a defensive fashion. You have a, a more flexible system, right? Because these units are smaller than before. You don't have these blocks of thousands of men. You have a something less, right? It can be up to one thousand, right? But mm, also between five hundred, one thousand men. Right, disposed, uh, you know, in you know two or m or more uh, in number in the front line, in the central line, and in the rear line. Um, and the idea, as we will see here, is that uh, also with a more increased effectiveness of um, the shots drilled, it, it would be able to you know wear out uh, the advancing uh, pikes uh, more easily, and or however adapting. More in the creating this net that, you know, tactically wise, this may not be uh, so intuitive. But the idea of having also more units scattered here, especially in defense, is a bit a principle of defense. The idea of scattered defense, the idea of you create somewhat a, a net you have to enter in depth, right? That may be, as we will see, that there would be some, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, downs to this as well because the, as you understand, the line now was w the single line was thinner. Right, it was made one third, right? Uh, but actually, there were three of them <laughs> on the field as well. So it's as if this big block had split into three, right? So it, it became individually, for example, more exposed to uh, enemy, um, you know, uh, attack power, especially the one of cavalry, because the ranks were, you know, um, the files were were, were shorter. Uh, but there were some tests, even in here, that suggest that the Dutch made that suggest that the system worked well. At the time, it was said that I don't know whether of these properly of ten uh, ranks, that, but that if three or um, or four were taken out, the whole thing crumbled. And instead, 
in practice, it turned out that uh, even taking you know important losses, the, the line would hold, right? And um, this was the main concern because the main problem, as you know, at this point was that if if you don't you know if you don't provide enough uh, protection to to the shots uh, with with your pikes. Enemy cavalry could take advantage of that, and in fact, as we'll see, especially after Newport, Maurice would modify further uh, this system by uh, actually deploying the shots in the rear of the pikes in the same line, but one thing at a time. Um, so, mm, yeah, this is basically the system had it had been created, and it gave some mm, to these the smaller tactical, this network of smaller tactical units, some greater mobility and flexibility right, to the Dutch compared to their opponents, right, in the m most contemporary armies. There were, as you understand, pros and cons, right, you don't simply change the system because it's, it's more, the, the units are more flexible by themselves, right, would have you know, the, the principle of mass here is not respected, right, you must have something that counterbalance, what, what counterbalance the thing was that as we've seen, these troops were much better drilled. So individ as individual units, they could do more, right? The, the big blocks that existed before of pikes flanked by shot were were conceived uh, like that because they, you know, lack, you know, on average, you know, a, a dramatic uh, drilled uh, uh, uniform training. They, they would mostly have to sit there to, you know, advance in mass when they, they, they had the upper hand and, you know, from the other side, the, the, the sh the, they would have to wait and shooting at them where they were advancing was pretty much it. Now, the idea is that if you have these smaller units and they have a higher, you know, uh, individual level of training, you can make them do things on the field that can be slightly more, you know, uh, dynamic, right? So that you lose a bit of mass, but at the, s the same time, you can, you know, maneuver more, more quickly, for example, which already, for example, for deploying on the field is a big deal. Mm -hmm. As we will see, some changes occurred also in this regard. Um, the uh, divisions, are, as we were saying before, were namely 550, but, uh, for example, when Maurice himself in 1592 reviewed his army in, bata in, in uh, divisions for the first time, their strength varied from uh, 750 to 1030. Right. There is also uh, Elton's diagram showing uh, a battalion of at least 972 men. Right. So, in practice, uh, these units were still kind of larger. Right. And this tells you that, uh, you know, in concrete terms, still, you know, such a sudden pass rate would have been, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, smoother. But still, it's important to stress here the depth of the line. Right, that still, you know, if there are more troops, if the depth remains the same, at least it covers a broader front, right? In terms, for example, of firepower, at that point, uh, it's a big deal. Um, Maurice is said also to have reduced the size of companies in the process, right? Because if you make the math here, you realize that basically um, this um, this divisions were smaller even than a regiment. Um, in in practice, but so uh, he is said to have basically changed company size from 150 on average. That this varied also to 110, 120, right? And considered that uh, some, you know, like in other armies, I've seen also the English Civil War ones. Um, the uh, normally the the first company of the regiment was the colonel's one. It was usually larger, not not always. Right, but in certain cases uh, here, also in the Dutch army, uh, it's uh, displayed. Um, Maurice is also held to have actually increased the proportion of pikes to shot, right? And this mm, seems reasonable if you think that uh, the increase of pikes was necessary to stiffen the thinner infantry line. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but uh, it's still mm, evident, however, that pikes. Uh, and a short uh, ratio mostly remained between two uh, to three, right? So it wasn't just a big, uh, a big change, right? Uh, 
and um, for, which is still similar to the, for example, the companies listed for you know for for the eighties of the sixteenth century. Though certainly also above the uh, one to two ratio at the beginning of that same decade. Mm -hmm. um, an important change that occurred after Newport in sixteen hundred seems to have been the following. That is to say, while the um, brigades, so as, as we've seen, these um, uh, multiple division lines were deployed on the field, um, simply passing from column to line, so essentially deploying the first division you know, in the front, then making the, the second uh, you know, marching towards um, the uh, you know its flight side etc and, and go on this uh, happened by companies by the way normally uh, at least in pre um, reform time right because before it was very messy because uh, normally the uh, the thing functioned like this uh, companies as we've seen had this ratio of bikes and shot by themselves but in on the field they would be grouped into these battalions um, uh, later divisions that basically brought all the pikes of the various companies together and all the shots of the various companies at the flank. And this uh, arrangement, for in order to save time, uh, happened already uh, in function of redeployment f during the column formation. So this meant that even during the march, there were lots of units that, of also of foreigners, as we've seen, that spoke different languages, that stuck together, that created problems, right, but, and were theoretically to redeploy like that. It was a bit messy, right? Um, this, this form of um, deployment from column to line uh, exists also in, before Newport. Sometimes after Newport, we don't know when. Uh, Maurice changed this, and basically he... Uh, began to uh, deploy brigades uh, one next to the other. That is to say, the single brigade, uh, the brigades would march in column one uh, after the other. Uh, so the first brigade would essentially uh, already be formed in depth, not by side, and would stand, would arrive on the battlefield and would be deployed like that, with literally one division after the other. Then the second brigade would arrive, would, would uh, deploy at its flank, right, also in depth, just like that. So it basically switched the line to column deployment, and this seemingly uh, was uh, an important change because it allowed the brigade at that point to uh, withstand more easily, more quickly, uh, uh, an eventual enemy charge, right, that, that you know, as, as you understand, if you start deploying in line, you, you have a thinner formation, so at least even if the first division had overrun, it would have been a second division behind, right? And not still all the, you know, the other brigade having to arrive. In the meanwhile, the first line being broken, let's say. It was important, right? Pro probably as a sake of protection. I didn't know how frequent this, um, you know, the threat posed by enemy, especially cavalry in the process of development uh, ever, you know, occurred um, in, in the 80 years war. Um, but this change w was important. Right to prov to provide uh, extra um, security in the first place, and for the rest, the the, the army would uh, fundamentally deploy in the same way. Uh, apparently, in this sense, as you understand, more in depth than in you know narrowing the the line as well. And this change, in fact, is mirrored by another um, uh, one that happened instead at the uh, divisional level, the single divisions. Uh, because originally, as we've seen, the Dutch divisions, uh, even in the first time of Maurice of Nassau, had maintained this idea of the pikes in the center and the shots on the side. Um, this is interesting um, because uh, this came at a divisional level by uh, coupling normally um, in, in the line of battle um, two divisions at a time. Which meant that since, by the way, the, the number of divisions was not always drawn, that there could be uh, an odd uh, third, for example, if uh, there were three uh, of them, that would remain out and make the thing uh, kind of asymmetric. But th does this mean th is that uh, the, two, uh, the, the two divisions infantry would be grouped together? Uh, 
and so its own shots deployed on, on the flank. That would be a third division left out. It couldn't be coupled with any other in, in, in the line of the brigade. Um, that at that point would have would be smaller, right? And therefore creating an asymmetry in the in, in the in the rank. But we would have as if it, it had been a one division and a double its own uh, on on the, on the side. Also, originally, uh, albeit the pikes. Of, of each division were grouped together actually th there was still a uh, a gap of some you know third you know some tens of meters between the um the pikes uh of the two divisions mm -hmm. uh that didn't also have uh and that's also why the explanation doesn't come it does, doesn't seem to have had uh, a specific uh, tactical function, right? It wasn't so large, so it may be like a, a, a normal gap of a unit, but given that the pikes should form this solid block, why wouldn't they group them, like, much closer together? Uh, I don't know this. I haven't found information on that. Uh, I just know that apparently this was like a weak point because, you know, if the enemy shot into it, whatever, that could be, uh, you know, gradually wearing out the formation from, from that side. Right, um, and uh, you know it could be uh, could be a gradually opening to match the line. Um, it, after uh, Newport, as we've seen, this change brought by Maurice um, in increased instead further the depth of the system. Basically, what happens is that the um, the, ma uh, the the shots would be deployed now not at the sides of the division. Uh, excuse me of the of the pikes within the division, but behind the pikes, yes, behind, and how did they shoot well fundamentally the the, um, the thing w was was carried out by leaving some space fundamentally between the the pike blocks right and having the um, the shots instead of uh, exposing themselves uh, being deployed on the flank of the pikes, essentially uh, being deployed entirely. Uh, behind the pikes and just the unit that had to shoot to come externally uh, in, into the gap behind the gap let's say better of left by the pikes in, in the front line so they would shoot right uh, the, the gap was also short and so fire in would be uh, concentrated within it um, and uh, and therefore also shooting fundamentally to anybody in the front who could have uh, you know uh, maybe thought of some idea of getting through, or you know, but the, the, I'm not sure that it, it happened. So, consider that the formations could be. It's not. Uh, we made a video about this. It's not much about the gap, but properly about the the solidity of the formation altogether, right? So this was still a way to reinforce that. Um, you know, th there are instances of cavalry properly charging straight into the pikes because they were wavering and breaking them, winning, right? There, are, there are examples uh, as we will see uh, about this. Um, and in this way, basically, the 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 shots could could you know could in fact shoot in the front at the same uh, rate of fire, uh, but essentially being not being exposed to the front line that now would be just covered by the pikes, right? And these gaps that would pour fire through, right? So this is quite interesting as a solution, and it seemingly. You know that's how it remained uh, throughout all this time today that we stopped fundamentally to the end of the of the Thirty Years' War in the mid seventeenth century. Um, was there in this process properly a standardization of the guns, uh, of the infantry shot? Well, uh, this doesn't seem to be true until sixteen twenty two, right? Um, the musket wasn't standardized. There is uh, some lists fundamentally showing the proportion of muskets to arquebuses increased, right? And while the halberds, the ha two handers, etc., disappeared. This is interesting because some armies would maintain them for for some for some time longer again, right? Um, and as we've seen, uh, normally still arquebuses were conceived to be deployed as the uh, external, uh, uh, essentially section of of the of the shot wings, right? So that obviously muskets were more important, being placed more internally, uh, uh, be more effective. Um, uh, there, there doesn't seem to have. See, Maurice did order that the equipment should be standardized, 
right? For example, pikes had to be 18 foot long, right? The the pikemen had to have all helmet, gorget, corselet, and sword, right? About a quarter of them also wore armor from shoulders to elbow and large tassets. Normally, the first ranks were heavier, right? Um, the idea here altogether, both for cavalry and infantry, was that you know, uh, armor, the, the present armor had to be bulletproof by a certain degree. That's also why as we will see the cavalry lengths decrease, because it properly couldn't penetrate anymore these uh, cuirasses. But musketeers and arquebusiers were supposed to have helmets and swords as well as their firearms, the lengths of cal calibers of which were also standardized, especially for the musket bow's weight that had to be 10 or 12 to the pound. An arquebus half this and who shot without this were you know would incur to severe um, uh, provisions and uh, still uh, since there were as we've seen also mercenary troops around sometimes it happened naturally that in the Dutch army also there would be um, troops equipped in, in a different way still however from the uh, let's say mostly yeah to, to, in, from the 20s uh, of the 17th century um, uh, the Dutch uh, stocks um, I guess we would be able to, to provide uh, the best arm uniform armament around, right, you know, along to these standards, so that troops that originally were meant at the beginning of the period to literally provide for their own equipment would be ever more mm, given the same by, by the state proper, right? The pay had existed before, but they had to provide themselves the stuff, right? Uh, still, food was to be bought by the soldiers. I importantly enough, um, in this time, at the beginning of the 17th century, uh, Dutch troops were properly ordered to bring several um, days' uh, rations of food in on campaign. That is also very important from a logistical point of view because they were meant to, at that point, to rely also on their own. So that, that gave them some, you know, also greater autonomy properly from from a logistical point of view at, at the level of a at a logis uh, properly an individual level right and then of course broader logistics would you know compensate for uh consider that properly also all these sieges were were important because it was a way not to risk too much in a single blow like in a pitch battle right it could be quite expensive um, and uh, many troops would desert. So that Spinola, for example, at some point said that in some circumstances it would be better to send troops to be slaughtered in, in, in open field or in, in the trenches rather than seeing them desert, right? Because they, they, the, the state had paid for them, and so they wanted them spent. And also why the Dutch, by a certain degree, uh, refused pitch battles, because they knew that they, they couldn't afford to lose it. The, their army, as we've seen, was not uh, very large. Uh, we will give some number uh, afterwards. Speaking of cavalry, the most important change in the Dutch army at this time was the replacement of the lengths by the pistol by Maurice of Nassau. So the uh, 11 ensigns of Lancers in service in 1597 were all converted to pistoled armed cuirassiers, along with three ensigns of arquebusiers. Um, so as we were saying before, the lanks fell out of use, mostly because of the technical incapacity to, you know, to, to properly functionally uh, break through late uh, apartment for f formation, um, and especially because of the greater uh, uh, shock force provided by firearms. Right, M Dutch cavalry here employed normally caracal tactics that was normal at the time. And there were also three ensigns of arquebusiers. However, at the same time, the heavy cavalry squadrons had attached to them up to 81 boys on baggage horses, right? Um, servants rather than combatants, right, to provide support to the riders, especially for forage. Right, uh, they were armed with pistols themselves, um, and they they were mostly young people. Um, here, the the aristocracy was present consistently in this. Right, uh, the Dutch one, as well as we've seen also these foreign elements. Um, some of the youngest were also trained, as it was uh, norm in the in the Spanish tradition, in, as reg as um, yeah, average pikemen, simple pikemen, uh, initially. It is quite common at the time to learn properly the rudiments of war. Um, but this lighter cavalry was intended to relieve uh, 
um, the heavier riders with the uh, in their expensive mounts from becoming exhausted uh, or properly being dispersed through the necessity of foraging right so that the the best units wouldn't be you know properly spent in a, and we have seen in fact uh, that how the the, the the standardized drill had invested cavalry as well so in this sense horsemen became became also less expandable in the process right and there is something similar to this uh, in uh, English cavalry at the same period in Ireland having similar servants that you know Ireland being still a bit, bit of a you know uh, savage reality with a lot of ambushes a lot of you know this kind of guerrilla things like that so in that case also these boys were kind of uh, as servants uh, sent out there uh, they were expandable, whereas you know the heavier guys would would uh, be in, employed just for the you know the the main roles were designed for, right? And uh, by 1606, the mounted arm, now given its own commander in Louis of Nassau, was uh, lieutenant general of the cavalry. He also um, wrote important uh, notes about the Dutch army, some of some of the most important sources we have in possession. And this was another yet another cousin of uh, Maurice um, uh, comprised some 40 ensigns so uh, 2853 uh, riders and uh, cuirassiers with pistols 890 arquebusiers 200 French lancers and um, uh, 350 dragoons right um, there were um, as we've seen uh, a lot of foreigners here too uh, we will list part of them for example the, the same guard of uh, I don't remember whether of Maurice or his uh, half brother and successor Frederick Henry uh, of Nassau was made up entirely of French horsemen right um, their bodyguards and um, th there were also this last uh, 350 Dutch, properly Dutch dragoons, so being conceptually mounted infantry that, however, seemed to have been a, a new and uh, unsuccessful experiment at the same time because uh, when they remastered as uh, in, in by 621, they listed as uh, arquebusiers, so this option wasn't uh, probably very yeah, successful. Um, mercenaries, there were among cavalry were especially Germans, but also the French, uh, the Scots and signs uh, of Erskine and Hamilton. Uh, there were the English ones of Francis de Vere, Sir Robert Sidney, and Thomas Villers. Uh, apparently, French and balloon cavalrymen enjoyed a very high reputation, um, so much, and especially as cavalrymen, right? That sometimes were preferred even over the lands and in double number according to Maurice of Nassau and himself and uh, Wu uh, seems by the way to have increased properly the, uh, the number of native Dutch cuirassiers which was a way still to essentially uh, involve more the, uh, the you know the Dutch elite into into the, the war and it, it, it's uh, it's destiny making them more competitive uh, along that, that pattern um, cavalry training was improved particularly in the use of firearms right the uh, standard Dutch formation in the ensign was uh, 5 per 5 1 um, the um, essentially the cuirassiers had 100 horses altogether because of the forage the spare ones the um, carabineers so the um, the the shooters had instead 125 um, which speaks probably for for the latter uh, about um, the you know more this need of um, foraging like having you know and be more expandable than the curious years so having also more risky uh, inter you know roles and uh, probably higher uh, horses losses however there is to stress that even the carabineers uh, increased their equipment later on uh, which may possibly um, uh, reveal the fact that they were ever more increased as shock force uh, a bit like uh, I mean less but still more uh, still closer to the cuirassiers themselves <laughs>
and the, the shock capacity of Dutch cavalry was impressive in this regard. Always combined, uh, according to the, the average caracal tactic, but still very consistent. Um, uh, this could, uh, as we were saying before, the deployment capability was particularly important. We surely know the Dutch um, achieved uh, important results against the Spanish, uh, probably by beating them on the uh, in the deployment phase and managing to overrun thousands of them at some point, um, just by attacking suddenly. So that uh, thing of you know deploying deploying quickly also for the Dutch was probably a real need for the risks attached to that. Um, f uh, maneuver. Marines also the various ensigns in regiments of three or four on the battlefield. Right, albeit still uh, these squadrons remained fundamentally independent as uh, as units from from an organic point of view. Uh, speaking of the equipment of the cavalry, well, the cuirassier was normally had a helmet referred to as salad, but uh, probably of the, the, the Dutch pot type that starts, but because the Dutch began now to properly also produce their own style thing, because before they were just basically, a, you know, uh, they, they hadn't this professional army, there was not much need of producing weaponry in that uh, standard and uh, functional form before the revolt, as we've seen. And this, in fact, uh, Dutch pot type is mostly common in the 17th century. Then, a gorget, a corselet, uh, that had to be pistol-proof in that matter, shoulder armor, steel gauntlets and tassels from waist to knee, with uh, two short, that is 42 bore pistols and a sword. Mm -hmm. And the horse had to be at least 15 hands tall, which is something around uh, 165 centimeters, which is not a few, actually. Um, so you, you see here the, a need of standardization of uniformity a bit at, on every level. Uh, mounted arquebusiers that uh, here before mm, it's a s synonym of carabinier and bandolier too uh, sometimes, so they're basically the same. Um, lighter cavalry were casket or pot, gorget and corselet, carabine uh, slung on a shoulder belt, one pistol and a sword. Um, and um, this uh, cavalry was meant also to be trained in the same way, because um, otherwise it was said that a, that a single cuirassier could route an entire unit of them. So collective training at that best, uh, the role was mostly also seen caracol in a more uh, regularized way. It was um, difficult to train uh, a cuirassier, right? Uh, whereas in a few it could take a year or more, whereas um, a cuirassier in, like, excuse me, a carabinier in, in, in like a few months could, like, could be a good one, even without previous experience, because they had to technically properly do less. Um, the greatest Dutch success in cavalry was uh, Turnout in uh, 1597, when they overthrew both uh, Lancers and pikemen practically on the road. Right, and there are beautiful uh, paintings, etc., that show. They are very, very bloodly, by the way. How close and how you know, properly exposed the cuirassiers and uh, carabiniers went to the enemy lines, right? And properly also how to literally to crush in them because shooting in, in that sense was uh, you know often uh, the uh, you know the moment where you could dis disorganize the enemy and overrun. And as we've seen. There was a depth properly of you know also in quality in the equipment in in the in the ranks etc. The first lines were the most trained etc. And you know if you could eliminate the first ones, the eventually the world formation grew ever more unstable proportionally. Um, this was not normality. If I'm not wrong, this happened in the phase of deployment, as we were saying before. Anyhow, still they managed to kill in in the thousands, right? So um, in this kind of Cavalry tactical aggressiveness is somewhat, uh, as far as I understand, typical of the Dutch in the period. Um, naturally, there were also combined tactics in this process. Naturally, that there was some ways to to maximize, as we've seen in interest of time, the uh, the shot and the charge. Right, sometimes with different lines, right of, of horsemen, so that. Mm, um, 
speaking of artillery, that was also an important arm, uh, especially during sieges, as you understand, and so much uh, improved by Prince of uh, Maurice, was through standardization. So there were 48, 24, 12, and 6 pounders. Uh, the, if I'm not wrong, the 24 ones at Newport opened horrendous gaps into the Spanish lines. Um, they, um, it seemingly the Dutch made uh, an intense use of canister shots. Right. Um, Consider that the rate of fire of these cannons was, was ridiculous. It was something like between six and eight uh, per hour, right? And uh, it um, they 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 overheated. They need to be uh, cooled now with uh, wet uh, ship skins uh, for f for some time. And uh, but seemingly they had a great psychological effect on the units. These were mostly aimed at pikemen, as you know, so to throw like the ball straight into the mass pikemen to, you know, to kill us, you know, to properly create these horrendous gaps. It was mostly about the psychological effect. And, then, and sometimes, literally, it was said that, you know, it was like better of 24 pounder than a, than a non-satisfactorily trained company uh, to wipe out an, uh, an enemy unit. Um, in fact, entire companies fled when hit. Uh, also by, by a single shot, like totally. For Louis um, uh, uh, wrote uh, that uh, basically, you know, in, in case the company was under, talking about infantry company was under a cannon fire, the idea would be to retreat very orderly, right? But panic and herd behavior would mostly spread uh, among, uh, especially the untrained, and uh, there was sometimes no way to to save the situation. Uh, the use of canister shots of these basically uh, loads with, with of uh, musket balls creating essentially metrile effect um, uh, might have been even in this context of the uh, 80 years war um, exploited thanks to the um, the defensive uh, role properly the also the uh, the barriers formed by ditches, etc., that could um, uh, shorten the distances also and render, as it's unknown by also Kosovinsen uh, theory, more bloody, right? The battle that is fought not just by two advancing armies, but to one that is firmly defending and under attack. And this was basically the norm at this time, right? So, um, naturally, the, the canister is less effective at, you know, um, at, at a longer range, so that that could be properly one uh, one indicator of such close range employment of um, of, of, of the same. Um, the Dutch made use of limbers for, for the cannons. This probably derived from Spanish use, which increased uh, naturally their their mobility. Uh, and uh, a siege train of uh, of about 1605 with 648 and eight uh, 24 pounders had. 316 horses in the teams, including spare spans, no less than 390 wagons, 30 cannoneers, and 300 matrosses, that is, uh, gunner's mates, uh, 300 pioneers, and a large body of technicians, including a pitter deer and a master fire worker. Yes, exactly. Uh, artillery units were mostly uh, commanded by nobility that was, uh, you know, also received, uh, as we've seen in the, the, from this Dutch cultural background, they were usually, you know, becoming to be properly educated also in the sciences. Uh, Maurice of Nassau, the Dutch in general, are credited to have introduced um, properly some new, apparently, you would say, banal technologies, but that were not banal at all at the time, and that uh, especially improved the officer's um, role, uh, importantly, such as the telescope, for example, that, you know, also was needed at Siva by sailors, etc., was used, uh, think about during sieges, for making calculations, all this uh, geometrical, mathematical um, observations, uh, and so on. Pioneers were fundamental, as you understand, and properly there was an ever greater attention to properly science, also of uh, pyrotechnics, of, you know, the, the, the various mix of explosives, hence the Peter Deer and the Master Fire Worker. Uh, was uh, quite uh, quite important, and uh, also we've seen for crossing rivers in the Netherlands that are plenty everywhere, or marshes, 
or this broader siege works like all these technicians were needed pioneers creating uh, bridges uh, passages for the troops I mean we don't even have to explain uh, their uh, their importance so as we were saying since the beginning of the video the Dutch army was not especially large right but thanks to its tactics its efficiency um, its professionalism uh, its organization altogether was among at least the best paid best trained best equipped of its day right uh, it's important to stress it was not the best arm right these tactics didn't bring all together well, well the Dutch army dominating you know the, the the art of war or whatever no there was nothing revolutionary like no right no no right and what they did yet was incredibly important for the time right they were the ones that first began to pioneer very important aspects of, of modern warfare that would eventually eventually uh, develop towards the trend they were the ones that probably were put you know in front of odds for which they had to risk in a way or another so their, their ex experience etc was was fundamental to to develop the same army for the sake of survival um, and um, definitely um, there even from the smaller things as we've seen the uh, two field Mauritian innovations uh, also hand grenades right Maurice introduced them uh, uh, used mostly in sieges uh, the telescopes for for officers are the same before right so even details that tell about you know the vivacity and the dynamism of in, in the rise right of the Netherlands the European and European battlefields that that will keep growing as we have seen also in, especially in this kind of almost business mode in which they they handled war right they had pretty clear in mind how to control this process from a political financial point of view right this was exhausting by the way right the commissioners complained they had to anticipate too much money the army rose steadily at some point in size uh, it exhausted the, the resources like it was a tremendous effort but that's exactly what makes that's exactly crisis that makes improvement, right? And that's why they, they came up with this, right? Um, and um, so, the speaking of later times, uh, just briefly about the Thirty Years' War, Dutch armies fundamentally remained the same, right? The essence was drawn, on, on, you know, under uh, Maurice of Nassau's times, and the only difference maybe being that the musket had become the sole infantry firearm so arquebuses or calibers but you don't want to call them light were out um, which you know was a process was taking over basically everywhere uh, it's not always easy to understand from you know in the second half of the 16th beginning of the first half of the 17th even from the sources what is a musket what is a what is an arquebus right because properly sometimes the sources say one thing for the others we're in pretty linear in time so we don't have that scientific uh, categorization for that matter um, we know however that by 1635 uh, the Dutch infantry had expanded to 35 regiments still of widely varying uh, size which is normal for the time from nine companies up though so you know being more consistent equally Colonel's companies were uh, 200, 150, the rest around 180 strong, as we've seen. Uh, speaking still of uh, firearms, um, uh, it seems like the, 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 uh, the early flintlocks had already appeared in some units rather than the usual matchlocks that were still the, the standard in Maurice times, like on Avery. Um And in fact, the the, the flint locks may have become standard only by the 30s of the 17th century which however for the time was was a big deal right this conferred to the same Dutch a firepower advantage and this thanks to their as we've seen their wealth their technological skills and so on um, the cavalry at last received a permanent regimental organization so were established regiments of four ensigns each that would remain permanent and ensigns were 100 strong at least on paper um, in three quarters of the 4,000 cavalry were cuirassiers with pistols the rest uh, 
uh, carabineers. Mm. So uh, it, it's a it's a brutal synthesis, and um, I should have said things banally. Where where was artillery placed in the IRA? Well, artillery was normally um, located on the flank, um, like in Maurice times, on the flank of the shots. Right. So you have the pikes in the center, the um, the, the, the say this uh, the, the shots on the sides, and then outer the. The, the artillery and cavalry would be properly on the flanks of the of the of the brig, uh, you know of the formation the brig, brigade formation altogether to intervene there so it didn't interfere much in in the center uh, and um, yeah there, there were also always this um, there were some skirmishing tactics as well there were ways also in post um, let's call it Newport times where you know, as we've seen, the the, the shots were in, in the back of the pikes. Um, for for these guys to literally turn in front of the, to to circle in front of the of the of the pikes and to throw a shot, right? And that was a way. Uh, another way was properly moving, still on the sides again, and shooting like that. Um, so it, it varied. Uh, over time, and, and yeah, and, and the Dutch brigade, as we were saying before, also became fundamentally a model for the Swedish one of Gustavus Adolphus at some point. And and the pattern is evident, like compared especially to the German uh, block, it was the most compact, or the the Spanish one with the um, short squares at the at the angles of the big block of pikemen. Um, the Dutch and Swedes would go on gradually to to thin and gradually the line so they were properly the ones who tried that first that realized right somebody did right we don't know what was the process behind this we don't have to think it was specifically the orange uh, or maybe somebody it was their officer was the soldier you know somebody came up with that it pro came up with that and realized by sheer practice that they could bet on firepower rather than than on pikes right um and this was the future in a sense right it would happen anyway uh in that context right it's just we have to credit the the dutch for having started this first and for having you know um more than that actually uh created the preconditions for rendering that possible in spite you know the dutch would have not liked that right you know they would have avoided to to fight the bloody war against Spain, but that's, you know, they did it in the first place, because evidently they, they couldn't take it anymore, and and this brought them on the fore, given this prolonged struggle, uh, because they had to provide those resources, those conditions that eventually rendered also its tactical achievement possible, right? Um, but, once again, there's nothing teleological about that, that is properly, they weren't, I'm, I'm not even sure, like, it, that, I don't know, Maurice of Nass Nassau and his uh, cousins were properly fully aware of the implications of their reform, especially the standardized drill or whatever. They knew it worked, but it, 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 the, the times were changing also very slowly, right? So things were yet to be seen, right? The Spanish kept fighting their own way. The Germans kept fighting their own way. Uh, throughout all a conflict, like, you know, the Thirty Years' War, that was a hell of, you know practice for that matter. Yes, the Swedes arrive and they, they, they make uh, an impressive feat, right? And in, alongside similar patterns even in there, they had the, their own preconditions. They sold especially a lot of steel that they had that were also financed largely by France, etc. And they managed, however, to find a system that had tested it against the Poles. They had, you know... Uh, so things came to happen for reasons that are not... Uh, like that, like a formula, their magic. Somebody woke up in the morning and said, "Okay, let's change this." No, they came for sheer practice and for sheer, you know, at that point, evidence, an evidence that we have lost, unfortunately. Right? It took also an important mind to do it, um, to organize it more than else. In fact, what is great of these reforms for the Dutch or the Swedes is mostly the the degree of organization. Like you understand that all this uniformation is is remarkable. Um, because it hadn't existed before, especially at this times in history, where you know you could say, well, in ancient times, yeah, but in ancient times they didn't have as much cavalry and as much uh, armor and as much you know firearms and all the need, you know, the log the artillery, right? You know, there, there were logistical uh, you know demands that the world had never seen at that point. So 
this thing was new, was truly modern, right? And it's important to credit them for for this. So um, we will. I don't know how often we'll come back talking about the Dutch army. At this point, we have to cover a lot of other Renaissance armies, but um, I, I would like to because it's definitely fascinating. It's definitely interesting. And it tells a great story of application, of, of vision, as you've seen, of, of resources, of, of intelligence that uh, surely makes a great, uh, great chapter in, in the history of, of modern warfare. So for now, however, we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now. I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time, bye.